Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be among you, and uh, it's uh, such a, a privilege to have the opportunity to share with you. The title I've got this morning is, Can We Know the Exact Words of God? And hopefully that will be appearing uh, on the screen shortly. Yes, it is. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a look at how we build a doctrine of scripture with seven pillars, because seven's a good number, a bit of terminology, some arguments for textual reliability of the Bible, evangelicals and the Old Testament text, and then, of course, we're going to have a few words about my friend uh, Bart Ehrman, whom I'm debating in July, looking forward to that. So let's begin with seven pillars of a doctrine of scripture. Why this? Well, seven's a great number, but I think what we've got to see is that when we define a doctrine of scripture, we, it's not just defined by one particular thing. You could have far more than seven pillars, it's just seven is a good number. And the first one I want to start with is that words come from God, sometimes called verbal inspiration. Secondly, that words are true. Thirdly, relevant. Fourthly, sufficient. Fifthly, clear. Sixthly, preserved. And seventhly, historical. Let's go through those in more detail, but not too much detail, just enough to whet your appetites. Words come from God. There are many passages in Scripture which talk about how Scripture is God's word. There are also passages which talk about how Scripture is God's words. In Leviticus, the most inspired book in the Bible... I mean, as in the most, more of it in modern translations is it within speech marks and any other uh, a bit saying God said. God is uh, quoted as saying things so often. Now, of course, uh, speech marks shouldn't really be in modern Bibles. They've only been around for about 100 years in modern Bibles. And they're a terrible idea because they make the translators have to decide where speech boundaries end, like in John 3, and it becomes a horrible mess. So there's all sorts of reasons for not having speech marks. And particularly if you're going off to translate the Bible into uh, languages that don't have it, not to impose those things in the new culture. But anyway... At least we can say there's lots and lots of scripture which is said very specifically to be verbal sequences from God. These verbal sequences are like pure words, like silver, uh, find in the fire, as we heard in Psalm 19, like gold, more desired than gold. As Christ says when speaking to Satan, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now we know God does not literally have a mouth. And yet, the words of Scripture are so closely connected to God that we are to imagine them proceeding from his mouth. That's the doctrine of verbal inspiration. And this is a mainstream belief, not just an evangelical belief. It's not just that one particular group of Christians hold it. Now, what is an evangelical? Evangelicals try to be normal. Let me explain. Evangelicals see themselves as airstreams, as heirs of the mainstream of New Testament Christianity. Now, whether they are or not, people might debate that, but that is at least what we are attempting to be and therefore we don't seek to hold any unique beliefs there aren't there is shouldn't be a belief that only evangelicals hold unless everyone else has abandoned it you see so when we look at the doctrine that words come from God this is actually mainstream this is mainstream Catholic this is mainstream Greek Orthodox this is mainstream Samaritan this is mainstream Judaism that words God can be connected with verbal sequences that's the norm and that's all that we're talking about when we say that and of course that not only do these words come from God but they are true because if God is true his speech has to share his character you can't say that you know I found someone very trustworthy but they lie all the time that doesn't make any sense No, if God is true, then his words share his character, his words share truth. So I think that this is how I would build the doctrine of inerrancy, simply that you have God who is always true and he speaks words and you put those two together and they inevitably uh, lead you to the inerrancy of God's words. Now then you, uh, there's there's a further step um, towards uh, how you talk about that in scripture, but uh, I think we have to make uh, those steps. Now, what that means is, 
that we are not at liberty to say, and God speaks falsehood. This is where, what gets a prophet into very big trouble in 1 Kings, 1 Kings, I think you say in your language, don't you? 1 Kings chapter 13, we won't go into the political ramifications there. 1 Kings uh, chapter 13, uh, where you have a prophet who's sent to prophesy against Bethel, and he thinks that uh, some further prophecy from God might be able to override that and as a result gets killed by a lion you can go and read that for yourself Um, if you think that God can break his own laws of non-contradiction then you're quite wrong Um, thirdly though you could have something that's entirely true but is irrelevant for instance that inerrant telephone directory of the place you don't want to phone. Uh, That's no use at all. So scripture has to be relevant to humanity. That doesn't mean that every text is the most relevant thing to you at every point. And of course, the whole thing about relevance is it can be denied by degree. You don't have to, uh, and and often this is what happens with uh, scripture. You know about beards, some of you even have beards. But the question is, when is a beard a beard? And you can't actually say, well, it's after this many hairs and when they get this long, becomes a beard it's what philosophers call vagueness same with when is a pile of sand a pile of sand how many grains does it have to have and you can't say well it when it goes from 99 to 100 grains of sand it becomes a pile you see now this is the one of the problems we have with the doctrine of uh, the relevance of scripture because you could gradually in your life drift away from thinking that scripture is relevant without there ever being a very clear line that you've gone over and yet you can see some people who are living their lives as if scripture is irrelevant and some people who are saying no this is what it's all about so one thing we have to uh, face is that scripture it, uh, claims to be relevant but not only relevant also sufficient now you could say that scripture is true and relevant but say it's insufficient to give you the way to salvation but in fact scripture claims not only to be sufficient to tell you the way to salvation but also uh, sufficient um, for how you should live but again it can be denied by degree I'm moving through these swiftly because I've got much to get on fifthly clarity You could have scripture and you could say, well, it's entirely true, it's entirely inerrant, but it's in an unbreakable code. It's encrypted, you know, in uh, in, uh, prime number encryption or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Well, that's no use, is it? So that's why there is also a doctrine of perspicuity or clarity of scripture, which has a main center on saying it's clear to show you how you should uh, be saved, but it's not just restricted to that. It doesn't deny that there are difficult passages. As uh, Peter says of of Paul, there are difficult passages in what he wrote. But again, it's regularly denied by degree. So at least three things about scripture, it's it's relevance, uh, it's sufficiency, and it's clarity are, if I can say, fuzzy at the edges. They are things that you could deny by degree. And I think there will be a challenge for many of you who will be uh, in ministry that some of the attacks on your uh, doctrine of scripture may actually come not as obvious frontal attacks saying you must deny such and such, but actually it's simply uh, an invitation to live other than uh, in the full light of scripture. Sixthly, scripture must be preserved. scripture must be available in order to benefit that does not mean that all scripture is available to all people all of the time for much of the middle ages all sorts of bits of scripture were not available to all sorts of people in Europe and they certainly weren't available in the new world a doctrine of the preservation of scripture can be abused it's often used by those who want to advocate the form of the Greek text that the reformers had the textus receptus to say this is what God has um, uh, preserved uniquely But what we can say is that scripture itself says that it's not just written for the generation of scripture. The Old Testament uh, is often said in Paul's writings to have been written for us when Paul addresses his own hearers and say it wasn't just written for that back then. Now, some people misread this, including my friend Bart Ehrman, who tried to think, therefore, God is under an obligation to preserve scripture for all people for all time and to make it available to them. Well, no, he isn't. And we know that because the book of the law was lost in the temple in the days of Hilkiah and the day before uh, of Josiah before Hilkiah discovered it and the day before Hilkiah discovered it it was still just as true as the day after he discovered it God's under no obligation to provide anyone with a perfect Greek text or Hebrew text or even a well-edited text but thank God that we do have such 
Now, seventhly, historicity. By the way, if you think I'm being at all controversial today, I will be more controversial tomorrow, so that's just an encouragement to come back. <laughs> now, historicity is again, there's been a general consensus of Christians and Jews historically uh, that over history that the Old Testament is historical. And history and doctrine, as we know, are linked, as in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, with the resurrection. If the resurrection is not true, uh, then uh, we are of all men the most wretched. We know, of course, that both amongst Jews and Christians, there have been allegorical interpreters. But Philo, Origen, Augustine, and so on, didn't deny that Abraham was a real character. They would simply deny that that was really the most important thing going on in the narrative. But again, historicity may be denied by degree. I want to put two texts in front of you to show why historicity of the Old Testament is important. Firstly, this text, which is part of the introduction to the Ten Commandments, where God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. There, God gives you his biography. And he also ties that biography that he brought the people out of Egypt to worship of him. So if you say, well, I'm, I want to worship God, and I define God simply by his atemporal characteristics. I define him by his omniscience, and I define him that, because he's triune. And so you build up the definition of God, and you say, that's the God I believe. But God also says, I am the God who brought Israel out of Egypt. And you say either he didn't bring them out of Egypt, or it doesn't matter whether he brought them out of Egypt. Either way, I'd want to say you are going in an idolatrous path because God himself has said, this is the God who I am. God is not just defined by atemporal characteristics. Another example, well-known text, where God says he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, he chooses to define who he is by particular people. If you say Abraham didn't exist, or it doesn't matter whether he existed, you're in danger of idolatry. So those are seven pillars of the doctrine of scripture just for you to think about. Now let's go on to terminology. How are we going to define the doctrine of scripture? Well, here we have a problem, and that is that evangelicals, in terms of their use of terminology for this doctrine, are doing very, very, very badly. Now, let me explain. One of the things we do is that we use the word original text. Problem automatically, look up the word text in a dictionary, and you'll find it's got more than one meaning. A hundred years ago, text was very clear. It was the texture of words. So you couldn't say, I hold a text which weighs five ounces. Nowadays, however, you can say, I am holding a text in my hand and it weighs five ounces. Therefore, text has come to mean two different things. One is a physical object and the other is the wording, right? Now, when we as evangelicals say God gave the original text, we only mean it in the sense of the wording. Now, what happens is, uh, people like uh, Ammon, I'm probably going to refer to him quite a bit today, um, uh, will often mishear this. And they'll say, well, you've lost the original texts, by which they mean manuscripts. Where are the original texts? Where are the original manuscripts? And we don't care about the original manuscripts. Why would I care about the original manuscripts? I care about the original wording, right? Evangelicals don't believe that God blew into papyrus and leather and made it super spiritual, right? Evangelicals believe that God spoke words and they were written onto papyrus and onto leather. But whether those words are contained or recorded in neurons or sound waves or electronically or in leather, we don't care. It's not more or less God's word. You know, when God booms his words from the mountain at the Ten Commandments, they don't only become inspired when they get put on the stone. They don't become uninspired when Moses breaks the stones. You see, God's words are his words. And so we need to recognize that we have been using ambiguous language. And so I'm replacing, saying that we should replace original text with original wording or original words because it's clearer. Of course, the other problem we've been doing is talking about original manuscripts, but again, we don't care about physical objects. We really don't care. You see, if you have the physical object that says, in the beginning was the word, en arche en halogos, or however, however you want to pronounce it, it doesn't become less inspired when it gets copied from one piece of leather to another, or one piece of papyrus to another. It's just the same. So therefore, 
I don't particularly need original manuscripts. Oh yes, it might be very nice to have some. It would sort of make uh, text critics a little bit, uh, well, redundant, but there we are. Now, this is where I get to a precious word, and that is the word Bible, as opposed to the word scripture. But let's remember, the word Bible is not a biblical word, whereas the word scripture is a scriptural word. The word Bible has been around for less than half of the history of the church. You say, no, 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 that's incorrect. (coughs) Bible comes from Biblia, and Biblia has been around a long time. Yes, and it was a plural. The word Bible as a singular has only been around for less than a thousand years. And what happens in English in the 13th century, I believe, but you can go and check your own history of it, is that you then get the plural Bibles. Now, when you get the word Bibles, you know what's happened? You've made something that's already plural further plural. And you can only do that when the word Bible has changed its meaning. So you look in the Oxford English Dictionary and you'll find that Bible's got more than one meaning. Bible ten, means the, the books of Holy Scripture and a physical copy of the same. Now, when evangelicals talk about believing the Bible, what do we mean? Do we mean we believe the, the, the words of, of the books of Holy Scripture or do we mean we believe a physical copy of the same. Actually, all of our doctrines are about the books of Holy Scripture, aren't they? So we've got a problem that this word is polyvalent. So I'm suggesting that we should often use the word Scripture. Now, in American English, the word Bible outnumbers the word Scripture, last time I checked, 11 to 1. And one of the reasons why Bible has become popular, and I still use the word Bible, is because it's very, very good for talking to non-Christians, because it's domesticated. It's a term they're happy with. You know, Muslims have got the Quran, Christians have got the Bible. But you look at our old doctrines of the faith, and you will find that they were talking about scripture, right? 100 years ago, 200 years ago, all of the reformed confessions and so on, all using the word scripture, the word Bible, absolutely absent. And what's happened is the word Bible has become more common. Now, what's the problem with that? The word Bible often in people's minds conjures up a physical meaning. I have a stack of Bibles here, right? And so you get into a problem. I believe in the inerrancy of everything God ever gives, right? And so I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. Then I substitute the word scripture with the word Bible and people hand me a Bible and say well do you believe that this physical copy is inerrant and I say well no there are loads of translators errors in there so no and they suddenly think I'm backing down I'm not backing down at all I'm simply saying the preferred vocabulary amongst Christians is to use the word scripture are you, are you getting what I'm saying here so even though this is a very precious word for us and if, if, we, we do need to think I'm not saying ban it we need to have reserve about it and realize that if we were talking about scripture all the time skeptics like airmen would not be able to have the target they often have now I'm at a center for biblical research but remember the word biblical if the word bible has two meanings the word biblical has two meanings doesn't it So let's be careful about these words and just use them advisedly. Another terrible word we use is inspired. Mozart was inspired. Why do we use this word? Of course, where it comes from to Timothy is God breathed. So we really mean God's breathed out. So let's just be reserved about using this word inspired and start talking about God breathed. Another word, we talk about the autographs. Now, again, we shouldn't care too much about the autographs. We're really concerned about the wording on the autographs. And I prefer that preposition on even more than in because I think it gives me the sense of that superimposition and gets it right. So I am just saying, let's recognize that if we were starting again and designing vocabulary, we would actually probably not use many of the words we use. Now, admittedly, they've got lots of of traction within evangelical and wider culture so we have to recognize that you start from where you are but you recognize also where you would like to be and I would like to say that I really want to use vocabulary which emphasizes that God gave words we are blessed to have those recorded in physical copies but the actual creation of a physical copy isn't what makes them come from God it was the act of him giving it and breathing it in the first place which makes it come from God So, 
My aim, if I am studying the textual criticism of the New Testament, is to get back to the original wording, the wording connected with those Christ first commissioned. With the Old Testament, I can't just talk about the original wording. I also want the final and original wording because God may have inspired, oh, there I am using that word, may have superintended his, uh, his um, authoritative blessing which kept people from error uh, onto people over centuries oh there's got to be a better phrase than that uh, uh, over centuries uh, uh, before the final um, writing of that uh, in scripture so I am but God's been working in his chosen people there were schools of the prophets and so on but I am wanting it as it was finalized and therefore becomes original to the copying process with some of you, I'll get a chance to talk through this later. Now, the title I had was, How Can We Know the Words of Scripture? And that's where we need to have a look and look at the word no, because the word no has changed its meaning over recent centuries, hasn't it? Last couple of centuries, it's become almost like shorthand for 100% certainty. So, you know, if you're too lazy to say, I believe almost certainly, you say, I know. But I want to say, you know, that's not what no means. Historically, it means warranted true belief. When you have a correct belief and adequate uh, grounds to believe it, then it is knowing. And knowing is upheld by God. And therefore, for me to know the words of Scripture simply means that God testifies these things to me and I have adequate grounds believing them and I can therefore know them. Now, in rhetoric, what's happened over the last few centuries is people have changed from saying I know what the original wording is to saying I'm not sure I know. So Matthew Henry will happily write and say the original says this and just confidently say that whereas now we say well, how do I know? So in other words there's become an emphasis on not knowing until you have it proven to you rather than having a disprovable presumption that God has actually spoken like this. So I'd want to say it's possible for us to know the words of God. Now, I also want to say we know the words of God directly. Um, often when people talk about scripture, they say the primary meaning of scripture is the human meaning, what the human authors meant. And then from that, we derive a sense of a secondary meaning, what God meant. And I want to say, no, you've got that all wrong. The primary meaning is what God meant. The subject of secondary interest is what Isaiah, or in your language, Isaiah, might have meant. Does that make sense? Um, and the reason why is I've got far more examples of God's style of writing than I have of any of the human authors of Scripture. Therefore, even from a scientific perspective, even from a linguistic perspective, I can be far often far more confident about divine intention than I can about human intention. So it's not that I have to go through and reconstruct a hypothetical historical situation for each of the things that I find in scripture before I can possibly work out what it means but that's where a lot of people would tell you that's what I have to do I have to go through this hypothetical position of working out what's the historical background for this unnamed psalm I then place it into you know history and then I work out what it means no I don't I read it in the context of scripture and that's, uh, of course, that doesn't mean you can't come up with ideas of its historical background. Now, arguments for the reliability of the text. We do have a problem, uh, and that is when we start talking about manuscripts, we can mean so many different things by manuscripts. So when you start saying, well, there are 5,000 New Testament manuscripts, what use is that as a statistic when a manuscript could be a fragment like that or something with hundreds of pages in. So we've got to make sure that as we teach people about this and teach churches and so on, we are educating them to think about what's actually going on. So they're not just learning isolated numbers, but they're actually learning to understand the whole of transmission of the, the Bible. Now, the um, scholar F.F. F. Bruce had a great apologetic for the New Testament text, and it went like this. Classical authors... Scholars accept the authenticity of many classical works accepted, uh, attested by only a few late manuscripts. Uh, New Testament manuscripts are more uh, and are earlier. Therefore, if we accept one, we should accept two. Now, that's a good argument. 
Provided your effort proofs, you know the numbers, you've done them all up to date and so on. And it's an argument from analogous trust. You already trust X, therefore you should trust Y. Often, however, what happens is you get a different presentation of the argument, and it's basically the argument from there's more of the New Testament than anything else, therefore believe it. But actually, there's more copies of USA Today. You know, uh, uh, you know does that mean I should believe that that's super inspired? No, that's, that's, that's fallacious. So what we should do is we should say, you already accept this. If you accept this, you should accept that. And in generally, uh, in evangelism, this is a good way of talking. It's actually a way Jesus spoke a lot of the time. Uh, he would, uh, with his counter questions you see in Matthew, uh, people ask him a question, he then asks them, why do you? And that's a, 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 an appeal to what they already do uh, for them to consider something. So let's not um, do that. I like the argument from vindicated trust for the text. And this is how it goes. You can look at various people from the past, great uh, heroes, of course, I could have had Spurgeon in, but actually he's a little bit late. Um, many uh, martyrs, and then we could say that actually, archeology span only really be begins with Napoleon Bonaparte just over 200 years ago. So we could say there's all these ordinary Christians that are reading their Bibles before archeology span begins. They read things like 2 Kings for, uh, chapter 18 about Sennacherib and Hezekiah and so on. And they look at all the claims that there are in a passage like that, and then people decipher Sennacherib's own account, and guess what? It's got some of the same stuff in. So that's an argument from vindicated trust. This is how it would work for the New Testament. This is Erasmus's 1516 Greek New Testament. And you can see the big E for en arche en ha logos. I know that's the way they do the OS when they want to. Kai ha logos en prostonte on, and so on. So you look at this and you say, well, basically, I can look at this letter by letter, and it's exactly the same as I've got today, except Erasmus doesn't have any manuscripts that are earlier than the 12th century. Now we've got manuscripts going about 900 years earlier than that, like this one. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and Ache and Halogos, or this one, P65 uh, six, was the last one, P66, this one. So here's my daughter in the Cambridge University Press, Press bookshop uh, window where we have our own Greek New Testament on display. And the great thing is you take the opening of John's Gospel and you have 182 words in the first 14 verses, 812 letters, and basically you have the same, uh, the same uh, wording and the same letters in Erasmus's edition, or in uh, the German Bible Society's editions, or in Morris Robinson's majority text edition, or the Society of Biblical Literature edition, or in the Tinder House Greek New Testament edition. The same letters for those 14, first 14 verses of John. And to me, that's an amazing thing because our manuscripts now are 900 years earlier than Erasmus's, and we haven't had to change anything, and it doesn't matter what your textual method was whether it's the SBL edition, whether it's Morris Robinson edition, we've all come up with the same thing because each one of those letters was handed down well over time. You say, aha, but you're just choosing you know, a good example. What about something like the woman caught in adultery? Well, that's fine, yeah, let's go look at that. So here we have not only Erasmus's edition from 1516, but we also have his own commentary on the New Testament. And this is what he says about John chapter eight. So we're gonna, hopefully you can see a little bit of Latin. Uh, so it, um, from, from chapter eight is where it says in line four, then we uh, get they brought to him, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman, then you can see that bracket, okay? You see that? Now, historia, can you see the word historia there? Line one of the new section. The, the story of the woman adulteress, known habetor, is not held in plerisque graecis exemplaribus, is not contained in the majority of Greek copies. And that was Erasmus 500 years ago. So this is the good news. Erasmus only has two Greek manuscripts he used to make his edition. He's got slightly more uh, knowledge of other ones. He knows the majority don't have this text. There are no surprises. Over the last 500 years, people have discovered more and more manuscripts, and they haven't been discovering new passages like this one. Erasmus knew about the ending of Mark not being in his manuscript. It wasn't in manuscript number one that he used. It's called number one because he used it. So in other words, over the years, so much more knowledge has accumulated, and it's not that we've had lots, lots more uncertainty accumulate about the text of the New Testament. In fact, we can have huge confidence in the text of the New Testament because we can say this, that brainiac 
500 years ago, Erasmus knew about the textual uncertainty about 77% of the verses which get verse numbers in things like the King James Version and are then doubted, questioned, or omitted in modern versions. In other words, if he had been just a little bit more attached to the Greek rather than the Vulgate, he would have been able to get there. Let me put it this way, because I'm speaking to Baptists, so I think I can get away with this. The Reformation was complete in the area of soteriology, right? But one of the ideas behind being a Baptist is that you actually think that, and I'm sure some of you aren't Baptists, but you know, most of you are, right? You actually think as Baptists that they weren't right on the subject of Peter baptism. So they weren't quite complete enough in their Reformation. So that's why you're Baptist, right? Now, the same issue could also apply in the area of text. 1517 is the Reformation, 1516, the eve of the Reformation, Erasmus comes out with a Greek text, which is good enough for the, uh, for the Reformation. There's a problem about being good enough. You don't actually need to reform it, you see? Because the, the Protestants are desperate to have common ground with their Catholics, uh, friends, so they can actually dialogue. And so no one actually reforms it, but actually when you go through what Erasmus did, he often deferred to the Latin Vulgate in decisions. If he'd been following the Greek texts which he'd had, he would have been able to get incredibly close to what we now have in a whole series of um, modern editions, you see. So in other words, the amount of variety that there is in uh, Greek texts is far less than there had been. So I'm, if you like, disputing a narrative that people often tell you, which goes like this. They had a wonderful text at the time of the Reformation, and then these awful people came along in the 19th century and started missing verses out. I don't think that's the way it really works. So what do we do when manuscripts disagree? Well, in textual criticism, you can say, let's look for good testimony. You can also say, let's eliminate variants that we can clearly show are secondary. And thirdly, what I would say when I'm producing the Tinner House Greek New Testament is, we're only editors. My job isn't to do what God hasn't equipped me to do. So he gives me manuscripts and I will seek to apply the, the uh, mental facilities given me to understand. And at the end of the day, a bit like a copyist has to copy what's in front of them, not what they think it ought to say. An editor just copies and edits what uh, comes from manuscripts to them and presents that and says, I've done my best. So what that means is we are not called as textual critics to a uh, definite, definitive identification of all inspired verbal sequences, but in fact, we're called to make an addition and pass that on. So. Therefore, what happens if you are preaching on a text and you're not certain whether the, um, the reading is this or that? What do you do? Focus on what you're most certain about. It's the same as if you're not sure what a Greek or Hebrew word means. Don't make it the center of your sermon, right? Focus elsewhere. What's interesting, however, is that as the gap gets uh, smaller, people's doubt about the text of the Bible has got bigger which just tells you that the doubt that people have about the text of scripture bears no relationship to the actual amount of evidence. Now, we're gonna leave the Old Testament text for a little while. Uh, sorry, just have to skip over that. Lots of really interesting stuff to get onto my friend Bart Ehrman because I do need to say a few words about him. And this really reinforces the question about terminology. This is what he said in his bestseller, um, misquoting Jesus. I kept refer to, referring to my basic question, how does it help us to say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God if in fact we don't have the words that God inerrantly inspired, but only the words copied by scribes, sometimes correctly, but sometimes many times incorrectly. What good is it to say that the autographs are the originals were inspired? We don't have the originals, we only have error-ridden copies, and the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the original and different from them, evidently in thousands of ways. Well, let's look at that first question. He says, we don't have the words God inherently inspired. I want to say, who says we don't? You say we don't, but you haven't produced any evidence for that. And even if we don't, a doctrine of scripture doesn't require the availability of God's word in every situation. Think of Josiah and the law. And then he says, but we only have the words copied by scribes, sometimes correctly. But hang on, the words are the thing that God gave. And they don't become less inspired or less from God when they get copied. So I'm not sure why that's quite such, uh, so relevant. Copyings don't destroy words. What good is it to say that we have the autographs uh, 
that they were inspired. We don't have the originals. Well, sorry, we've been using unclear terminology, but you, know, you shouldn't be reacting against terminology you heard when you were a teenager. Um, <clears throat> We have only error-ridden copies. Well, let's imagine a conversation between Ehrman and Augustine for a while, just if you can come with me on this. Uh, Ehrman leans over the shoulder of St. Augustine, who's got a Latin copy of John in front of him, and says, don't you know that scribes make errors when they copy? And Augustine would say, no one ever told me that. No, no he lived in a copying culture. He would be fully aware of that. So why would Augustine think that the fact that, that Ehrman had told him that scribes make errors falsified Augustine's belief that, there, that God had given scripture and it was true? Augustine's able to distinguish very easily between the physical Latin copy he's got in front of him and the doctrine that he believes that God has given true words in true books. You see? So in fact... Say we've only got error-ridden copies. Every scribe in the Middle Ages knew that copies contained errors, but that did not overturn their belief that God had spoken completely truthful, truthfully and given scripture. So in fact, it's only as people have got so used to typographical and close to perfection uh, nowadays, that it's even become a threat where people have sometimes not distinguished adequately the physical copy that they have from what we believe about the word of God. And then he says the vast majority of these are removed from the originals and different from them evidently in thousands of ways. Well, again, Christian scribes were aware of that. We don't have the originals. Well, I'd want to say that's irrelevant or misleading. We do not have the original text. I'd want to say, can you prove that? The text is uncertain. I'd want to say, look, God's quite certain of the text. Often we put, even in footnotes in Bibles, the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. And I think, no, what you should really say is the translation committee are uncertain about the meaning of the Hebrew. Because God's quite certain of the meaning of the Hebrew. So there's a distinction we've got to make. When we say something's uncertain, we mean I am uncertain about something. And that's really important because otherwise it looks like we're saying that God's uncertain and God's given something's uncertain, and that's not right. So God's certain about the meaning, certain about the text. What if we say we don't have the originals of the book of any New Testament? It implies we're supposed to have the autographs, but Christians have never believed this. What matters is the wording, and no one's shown we don't have the wording. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament, he said in one place. Uh, he implies that that's bad, but he doesn't highlight where all manuscripts agree. He's got this wonderful statistic where he says, you know, there are 300,000 variants in the New Testament. Well, there are 134,000 words in the New Testament and about 2.6 million pages. That's not that many variants. And in fact, imagine you had 10 billion manuscripts or 10 trillion manuscripts or whatever comes after that, you'd have more variants. Does that mean the more manuscripts I have, the more uncertain I am about the text? It doesn't make any sense at all. So it's simply a mathematical nonsense. So I'd want to say, actually what's happened over the last few hundred years is the number of manuscripts has gone up and up and up, and we haven't had an increase in uncertainty. He often claims that scribes deliberately change scripture. I was in a little debate with him uh, over radio, sitting next to him, and I said, basically, Bart, you're an intelligent design advocate. He looked really shocked at that point. And I said, I said look, even intelligent design advocates start like this. They say, you look at things and you say, I'm going to suppose they're produced by chance unless I can produce a really compelling argument that it would have to have been designed. Whereas he says that variants are produced by design deliberately unless you have a compelling argument that it's by chance. So I said, basically, you're starting with default of intelligent design, which is absolutely unnecessary. He always seems to prefer to say that things are deliberately changed rather than just people miscopy things. So I'd want to say for all of these reasons, it, his attack doesn't work. But then he says this, what good is it to say that the words are inspired by God if most people have absolutely no access to them? Well, how many of you became Christians through reading the Greek or Hebrew? How many of you became Christians through reading something in English or a modern translation? A few of you. How many of you are just waiting to become Christians? Okay. Um, can tell you, we'll have the altar call uh, soon. Now, one of the things, uh, yeah, something some just needs to sort out here. 
Maybe it's Midwestern culture, yeah? I've, I've heard about Midwestern culture. Not, not as in this Midwestern, but Midwest culture, sorry. Um, <clears throat> you know, you're all, all shy, aren't you? Not like the extrovert English. Now, how many of you know Harry Potter in the stories? Okay, a few more than the Christians. Good. <laughs> Well, you know what happens when someone meant, meant, is meaning to say diagonally, and they say diagonally. They go to the wrong place. Now, the idea with these magic spells is if you say one thing wrong, it doesn't work, or you get the wrong effect, okay? And people have this idea with the word of God that if some bit is mistranslated or miscopied, somehow that invalidates everything and makes it not work at all. I don't want to say, no, the Bible is not like a magic spell. Uh, it's, it's not like that. In fact, people, <clears throat> I'd want to say, <clears throat> it's more like uranium. You don't say because the uranium is not 100% enriched, nothing is going to happen. I want to say the word of God is like that. It's so powerful that in the most corrupt medieval translation, it's life-changing. And the great news is this, even bad translations have so much of God's truth in them that people can get saved through them. So in fact, we don't get all worried about, oh no, there's a bad translation, therefore nothing's going to happen. That's what you'd worry about if it was a magic spell. But it's not like that. It's the powerful word of God, which means that even in a bad copy and a bad translation, things are going to happen. So what can we conclude about this? How can we know we have the very words of God? By trusting reliable testimony. There's lots of evidence, there's lots of testimony, that's what God's given to us, and that can be rationally analysed and appreciated. Knowing it is warranted true belief. And what that means is we can effectively have immediate direct knowledge of God, not resulting of going through some path to get knowledge of God's word, but actually we can know this comes from God. It's not overturned by our fallibility. God has given us his word and he's also given us his Holy Spirit so that we can, as we look at um, whether it's a translation we have or we look at the uh, original languages, which hopefully you're all doing on a regular basis, we can actually know that this is God speaking to us. And we also can rationally believe that the words that we have in Greek and Hebrew are the ones which have been handed down over the years from him. Thank you very much for listening. I'll step down now. <laughs>